appropriate for the message that we're going to cover today. I am glad to be with you here in Kapaha, Hawaii. It is another absolutely stunner of a day. We are out here on this beautiful point, and uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful place to worship the Lord. Again, for my brothers and sisters from Crossroads, uh, it's sad to have these empty buildings here. Uh, we are, uh, I, I miss fellowship together. I miss uh, having, uh, standing around praying for one another and eating snacks after the fellowship. And uh, I miss uh, Sunday fun day with, uh, with our kids that, uh, that we go out and do adventures with on Sunday. I, I really miss our circle of prayer in the morning. Um, our call to worship, uh, it's just not the same on a, on a camera, but um, at least we have them. You know, in Paul's day, he wrote letters to the churches from prison, so we're going to call this a step up. At least we have, we have uh, comfort, we have a beautiful day, and we have uh, um, the Internet to go live here with what we're going to teach. So uh, join me this morning as we look through the book of John. Now, last week, or last time we, we taught this two weeks ago, we just finished uh, the resurrection. So um, the, the Christ had been taken down from the cross, and he'd been carried to the grave. He'd been placed inside the stone rolled shut. Uh, three days later, the, the large angel rolls the stone back. The guards all pass out from fear and quaking. The uh, ladies all come and look in the tomb. The older ladies that were apparently first go running back. Mary Magdalene stayed there, and as, as she's... Uh, investigating right after they left, she speaks to the two angels, and then she turns around and she sees Jesus, and I want to start back with that conversation and get a little bit of flow going before we, we jump into the book of John. So book of John chapter 20, we're going to call it the aftermath. John chapter 20, verse 15, and Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned himself and saith unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. So this was where we left off last time, where Mary had just, Mary Magdalene had just seen the Lord, and she leaves and goes heading back. Now, if we look through all the accounts of the Gospels, and we'll be doing that a little bit today, but as we look through all of the different accounts of the Gospels, we get to see that we have different perspectives from different uh, authors about emphasis on different parts of this. Now, some people see that as a conflict, that the Scripture is somehow um, conflicting with itself in, in the way that this is, this is uh, presented. But I don't see that at all. I have gone through it carefully, and we can lay out the different things that happened at different times, and there's a different emphasis sometimes. And uh, we can tell that because when we get to the book of Corinthians, Paul recounts this whole process, and he gives us a quick summary and an order. And what this tells me by looking at this letter to the Corinthians was that this was a story that he's, that he's referencing that everybody knew. By hitting the, the key points, the highlights, that he's sending to the church, he's, he's saying, you know these things, and, and, he, and he references them out. So all of the Christians understood the timeline of this story that took place. They understood what happened, and they didn't see a conflict between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So look what Paul says right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And then he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once. Now we don't have any record in the four Gospels of this particular 500 brethren, but it was well known, it was something that he's, Paul's referencing, that there was a time that Jesus spoke to 500 brethren at one time, they all saw him, and he addressed the whole crowd. Of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some are fallen asleep. So Paul again says, you guys know the story. These Most of these guys are still alive. In other words, check me out. You know this to be true. So this was a, this was a common knowledge, continuing on 1 Corinthians 15, 7. 
After that, he was seen of James, then of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of time. And if you'll recall, as Saul's on the road, he gets blinded, and and uh, Christ comes down and speaks to him directly. And Paul was the last one to directly speak to Christ in that way uh, in uh, until the book of Revelation. So uh, this was... this. What we want to do is lay this story out as best we can and understand the the order that things take place. So when we had the ladies, they come down to the tomb. The group of them are looking in while Mary Magdalene is weeping and crying outside. They see the one angel. They take off headed back. Mary Magdalene comes up after they left because they didn't speak to anyone. She looks in the tomb, and there's two that's standing there or sitting there. She speaks to them, turns around, speaks to the gardener, and Jesus says, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended. But go back, and he says very specifically, tell the disciples that I'm going to descend to my God, your God, up into heaven. So he, he, very, he has a message for Mary Magdalene. And each time that we see one of the disciples or someone interacting with Christ, we see that there's a specific reason that that interaction takes place. We can see the why, as we look back on the, through the lens of history, we see the why of that interaction. And we see the, the ones that are speaking with Jesus, uh, the way that they address him, the way that they talk, what takes place, adjust that interaction. It makes a difference. So here we're going to pick up as the women are all leaving the tomb and they're heading back. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held his feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go to Galilee, and there they shall see me. So remember just a few moments before, maybe a, a, a few minutes. I don't know how long the trip was from the sepulcher back to where they were staying, but as the ladies are traveling back, Mary Magdalene speaks to Christ. And he says, don't touch me, I've not yet ascended. They're still heading back, and he gets in front of them on the way back. Meets them, and they hold his feet, and he finds that acceptable. Jesus had completed his role as the high priest coming into the holiest of holies and presenting that blood before the mercy seat. Having completed that role, he was then once again, if you will, in his street clothes, and they were allowed to come back and to touch him. Now, why the, why the uh, explicit nature, why would he say this explicitly? Why would he make a point of talking to Mary separately, Mary Magdalene separately from the others, and telling her, don't touch me, and allowing them? Because he wants us to recognize his function as a high priest. This is how we know what took place there, and that he took the blood and presented it. He wanted a complete picture of the gospel to take place and for us to understand that. So he goes to Mary Magdalene and he says, I am, I am going to uh, go back to the Father, don't touch me. And he goes to the other and they uh, touch him and talk to him. And then as they're traveling back, Mary Magdalene catches up at some point and they go and speak to the disciples. Matthew chapter 28 verse 11 will continue on. Now when they were going... Behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed to the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers. Now I want you to consider this. Remember Pharaoh. Remember, remember God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And you remember that, that the end of Pharaoh's life, he chases the children of Israel in between two gigantic walls of water to try to kill God's people. That was the dumbest thing that any soldier's ever done. That was so stupid. He had just lost the entire wealth of his nation because of challenging this God. And this God is holding the water back, and he doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is quit holding the water, and Pharaoh's going to drown it was an incredibly stupid thing to do to run in the middle of these two walls of water and, and get killed that way. But he had lost his mind. His heart was so hard, he was so set on taking vengeance on the people of God that he had just lost his mind. 
He was just acting out of anger and out of pain and out of just frustration and, and stupidity. You know, God hardened his heart with actions, with Moses' actions, by doing things in front of Pharaoh, till Pharaoh really just couldn't stand God anymore. When the John the Baptist first came, we read about this in the first couple of weeks of the book of John, he's preaching repent, the Pharisees came out. They came out and listened. John points his finger down at them and says, repent! They didn't appreciate that. They went back. John chapter 3, we have Nicodemus coming, and he, we know he still loves the Lord at this point. But, but he says, Master, we know, and he's talking about the, the counsel of the Pharisees, that you're a teacher come from God. They, we know that you are something special. Give us some, some understanding. And, and Christ talks to him about, about water and being born in the water and then being born in the spirit and the wind. And the Pharisees weren't very satisfied. And then Jesus goes and he does things like eat with publicans. Ooh, they hated that. Ooh, that just, yeah. How could you go and eat with that guy and not come to our house? That frustrated and angered them. And then he did things like heal on the Sabbath day, right in the middle of the temple. Oh, my goodness, that was just, that was just so against everything that they had taught. And slowly and inextricably, their heart is turned against Jesus. Later on, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And I think it's one of the most flabbergasting things that the Pharisees did, is they wanted to kill Lazarus again. At this point, they've accepted that Jesus has raised him from the dead, and yet they want to kill him again. And now, Matthew 28, the guard comes back that they had set to watch this tomb, and I don't know what happened. Maybe it was the soldiers, maybe not, that was in front of the tomb. This angel comes down from heaven, voice like thunder, ground shakes, tomb rolls back, Jesus walks out, the guards see all this, they can't do anything about it. They get up and they go back, and you know they're trembling. They're afraid they're going to get killed. What are we going to do? They go back and tell the Pharisees. Uh, you know, they get to the first one. They probably go to uh, Ananias' house, and they go, uh, 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 you know, this angel came down, and the other guard was like, he was that big. And the other guard goes, yeah, he had this sword. And the other one goes, he rolled the hand back with one hand. I don't know what they said, but you can imagine a group of guys trying to explain why all these grown soldiers fell on their butts while this guy gets up and walks out of the grave. The Pharisees' hearts are so hardened at this point. They're so dark and so wicked that they pay them money not to tell what they'd seen. So it says that when they, the watch came and said, these are the things that were done, this, this is what happened. They gave them large money and said, tell a different story. Now, this is a warning to us. The Bible talks about sin and its cascading effect on our lives, that it's deceitful. And, and we'll be full of sin, and then we'll be wise in our own conceit, and then we'll say there's no God, and then we'll be given over to, to unclean flesh, to homosexuality, and then our minds will get twisted, and God will allow the thing that is just to happen in our minds so that we are so twisted that we end up like these Pharisees. That we end up going, we're going to pay you money, to tell a lie so that we don't have to recognize publicly that Jesus was God. Now, why wouldn't you recognize that? If you found out why, I mean, this is proof. This is absolute proof. Why would you not repent? Why would you not come to God? You see, the problem with the evolutionist is not in his mind. It's in his heart. The problem with saying there is no God it's not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. And it's a hardened heart full of the deceitfulness of sin that says, how dare the everlasting God tell me that to come to Him, to address Him, to, to, to go live in glory with Him, I have to do it on His terms. Absolutely not. There is no God. That is the progression that takes place. Young man, young woman, when you're starting out, you have a tender conscience before God. If you're 13, 14, 15, you're starting hopefully with a tender conscience before God. When you pick up that phone and you start filling that tender conscience with pornography, there's coming a time that you slide off of the hill and you stop thinking about the wickedness of that, 
about the pain that that's going to cause. When you get to that place of greed, having done business for a long time and and taking money and stealing it, you'll get to the point to where you'll steal the money from the church, knowing what it's about, knowing that this is not yours, that it's God's money. And your heart's going to be so hard that, that it just seems reasonable to you. Let these men's wickedness be a testimony that slows us down, that changes us. Continuing on, Matthew 28, verse 13. He said, I gave them large money and said, saying, Say ye, that Pharisees said to his disciples, Here's what we want you to say. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews till this day. So these Pharisees, now remind you, these are the guys that told Christ that it was evil for a man to carry his bed after being healed from affliction that had been all his life. Couldn't walk all his life. Carrying a mattress. How dare he? That's evil. This is the, the guys that when they brought Christ to Pilate, they wouldn't cross the threshold into Pilate's house. They stayed out by the pavement and, and had Pilate come out to them because they didn't want to be in a Gentile's home before the Sabbath day. These are the guys that has stood on the street corner and said, I thank thee that I am not like these publicans and sinners, but that I have this cloak of righteousness that I've kept. These are the same guys that paid money to soldiers to lie and said, if you will lie, we'll back up your lie with the governor. We'll protect you in that lie. You know, when these guys were young and they were learning the scriptures for the first time and they were stuck, they wouldn't have done this. When they wanted to make a difference and were learning the way that, that Paul was when Stephen was stoned, Paul was, was going along with the guys that were there, but he hadn't experienced all this. But when he experienced Jesus firsthand, he repented. But as they grew in their age and, and their position and their power, the structure that they had and their hearts got hearted, they were willing to be disobedient to the law of God, to the things of God, in order to get what they wanted. It is, it is a warning to all of us. It's a warning to preachers. This happens to preachers. They spend their life in a position of power, and then when it's time to, to do something in order to hold the authority, they're willing to step against the Word of God and the things of God. Now, I think that probably doesn't happen that often. But I think it does happen. So it's something that I am warned today about. Be careful. Back in Luke chapter 24, verse 9. And returned from the sepulcher, this is the ladies, they've all come back, and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. So we find out here that Mary, who had spoken to Christ first, had caught up with the other ladies at some point, or she got there right after them. And all of the ladies, together and separately, the one group says, I saw Jesus when I was almost back. And we talked to him, and Mary said, I saw him before I left. And he said, I'm going to the Father, don't touch me. And they said, oh, well, he allowed us to touch his feet. And so they're all telling the stories to the disciples, to the apostles. And their word seems to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So the disciples, as they are, as they hear the story, they're getting ready to leave for Galilee. We'll see in a little while. It's early in the morning on the third day. And, and the, the ladies come and they tell him this, and the disciples are like, I don't believe you. So Peter goes running back over to the tomb, and he looks in, and there's the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in, as though his body had just disappeared, left the grave clothes, and he had come out dressed in his robes of righteousness. And Peter's just, wow, what does that mean? You know, it wasn't a week ago that Jesus said, I'm going to die, and the third day I'm going to raise again, and I'll meet you back in Galilee. It was, it was a few days ago. And yet Peter didn't believe him. We look at this and we scratch our head and we go, well, what was he thinking? 
Well, what's going on? But you know, we weep at funerals. You know, we do. I, we, when we when our loved ones pass, that we know they're born again. We know they're going to be with Jesus. We know we say it. They're in a better place, but we still weep. Paul says we sorrow not even as others, because we know this. We know that they're going to be with Jesus. But but knowing here, knowing here, it's different. It's different. And and Peter heard the words. But it just, it just didn't sink in that it could be true. His hopes and his dreams, everything had crashed. Every plan that he had of the Messiah coming and, and the, the gates of Jerusalem being shut to the Gentiles and God's kingdom being set, every hope that he had was crushed. And he just couldn't stand back up. He just couldn't bring himself to believe that he had been raised from the dead. Verse 13, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them, went that same day unto a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. So two of these guys are walking. It's about seven, seven and a half miles. They're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they talk together of all the things which had happened. Now, as these guys are walking, I am sure that they have times of, of weeping and mourning, times of joy, times of remembering what Jesus did and what do you think's next, and was, was John the Elias to come? And they're, they're talking about what happened. And it came to pass, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, this is, this is a great story. This is, you imagine they're, they're walking along and, well, why do you think, you know, what about that promise he made? What about, and they're talking about Jesus, you know, and he's standing right behind them, like right there. And he's kind of walking along with him, and he's listening for a while. And they're like, yeah, nobody died. No, that, that can't come to true. It must have been allegorical. He must have not meant that literally. And Jesus is walking along right behind him. And they go, yeah, but, but do you think he could have risen from the dead? No, no, he's nobody's here to read. Maybe in the future, Jesus is still standing right there. You know, the Bible says that, that God knows all of our words. He's, he's captured them all. Not just that, he knows our thoughts and the intent of our heart that don't even make it to our thoughts. God knows that. You know, Jesus is standing right behind you. You know, he's, he's right there while you're talking. Next time you're at work and you're thinking about that dirty joke that you just saw, that you're going you're gonna to tell you, remember Jesus is standing right there. Remember that God is watching you. When you start talking to your wife or when, like, when you start talking to your husband or to your kids, when you start talking about them that have the rule over you, and how dare they? And what a bunch of, remember, Jesus is standing right there. The one that said, obey them that have the rule over you, he's standing right there. It's a good reminder. So they're walking along, and they're talking about Jesus. And uh, they're reasoning. They're, they're going through scriptures. They're discussing it. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Jesus comes along, and he keeps them from recognizing him. You know, God can do that. You remember the story of Elisha uh, in uh, 2 Kings where he is, uh, he is well, he had told the king about the trap that the Syrians had for him, and so the king had kept avoiding it. So the Syrians decided they got to kill Elisha before they can kill the king. So they, they come to kill Elisha, and the, his helper there is freaking out. There's all these chariots and soldiers everywhere. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha goes, Lord, open his eyes. And his eyes opens, and Elisha says, remember, greater is he that's with us than those that were with them. We have a lot more chariots than they do, a lot more horses. Remember, God can close and open your eyes. The Scripture says that we've entertained angels unaware. We have looked and talked to people that we haven't known were messengers or angels of God to trust, test and try and direct and teach, and we don't know it. So treat people as you think the Lord would want to be treated. Matthew 25 says, Whatsoever you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. Sometimes the least of these is Jesus. It is one of the angels. It is somebody that is waiting for you to act the way he's told you to act. Jesus is standing right there. Luke chapter 24, verse 17. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that thou hast one to another? As you walk... And are sad. Jesus, what are you talking about, guys? Why are you sad? Verse 18. And the one of them, whose name was uh, Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known these things which are come to pass there in these days? 
And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and withered before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. So here are these guys are walking along and they're explaining, Do you don't know about this? You don't know what's happened? And how a chief priest? Now let me ask you. Was it God's design for Jesus to die? Was that God's purpose? It was. Was it, was it an accident that these particular high priests were the high priests at that time? No, it was not an accident. Was it an accident that Christ came when, when the Romans were in church? No, it wasn't. So was God directing the heart of the king as he might direct a river to do the things that God wanted done when he wanted it done? Yes, he was. Be careful when we criticize those that have rule over us. I'm not saying we can't. I understand we live in a republic. I understand there's a rule of law that supersedes any elected official, and they have to abide by the rule of law. But God has placed people, sometimes evil people, in a position of authority for something that God's going to do. I have found more opportunity to witness and to be a blessing to people in the last month than I have for a long time in that short of a period. It, the doors have been blown open in places that were shut so that we could give the gospel of Christ. But if we are so filled with angst against how the state or the people or whoever are standing against us, then we can miss what we as the church can do by loving on others. Don't miss it. Understand that sometimes God has placed people in authority to do the wrong thing so that you can do the right thing. So look for how you can be obedient to God, not how you can blast the guy that's doing the wrong thing. And the chief priests and our rulers have delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they said, it happened three days ago, and we trusted the past tense. We had believed that he would, but our hopes had been crushed. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said he was alive. They said, here, we've, we've been here, it's the third day, and these ladies said that, but honestly, we don't know. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found him, even so as the women had said, but they saw him not. So they said, Peter went back. He went back, and sure enough, the tomb, the tomb was empty, the grave clothes were there. And he said unto them, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You see, when Christ was here, he had laid aside his glory and took upon him the form of a servant. And as he was arisen from the dead, he took his glory back. He has his glorified body. It's no longer a mortal body. It's an eternal, immortal body. And he says, don't you realize that for the coming kingdom, for what was going to take place, this was always the plan. Now, every time that we see one of the, this interaction, we see that there's a reason for it. And the reason that I think for this interaction is because Christ gets to be part of a Bible study but I would love to be a Bible in this Bible study. I would love to hear Jesus teach Jesus throughout the Old Testament. Man, that would be good. To hear the whole thing taught by the one that it was written about. And, uh, and so he does. For the next day, just left Jerusalem, so maybe for the next seven miles, walking as they're going, Jesus starts opening the Scriptures. And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Now, what would have happened if they hadn't said, Abide with us? If they had not asked Jesus into their home? I think he would have kept walking. I think that it was their choice to invite Jesus into the throne. And if they hadn't, I think he would have kept walking. 
it is it is important for us to recognize and treat others the way that we think Christ would want to be treated. As you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. As you've loved me, love your neighbor. You know, the scripture is very plain. We just don't believe it. We're like Peter. We read it and we just don't believe it. Luke 24, 30, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scripture? They, they, can you imagine being at the supper? He breaks the bread and he hands this fellow that loaf and he hands this fellow that loaf and they eyes are open and suddenly it's Jesus. How could we have missed Jesus? It's Master and he's gone. And that's it. He's gone. They they jump up from the meal. Right then and there. They jump up. And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They just walked over here. They turn around and go right back 15 miles this one day. Over here and back. And it's in the evening now. They returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. And then they were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed. And hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way. And how he was known of them in breaking of bread. So now the disciples have heard it from Mary Magdalene. They've heard it from Mary, the mother of Christ. They've heard it from Joanna. They've heard it from these two guys, Simon and, and, and Caiaphas, or Cleophas. And, and they've, they've heard all of these, that we have seen Jesus. So surely they'll believe it now. After that, he appeared in another form uh, under the two of them. So this is Mark recounts the order of events. And I want to pick this up because it says how the disciples received it. So Mark 16, verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form to the two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went in and told it to the residue. Neither believed they them. So they went back and they told it to the other eleven, the ones that were still there. And they still didn't believe them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat and upbraided them because of their unbelief and the hardness of their heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. So in a minute, we'll see where Jesus shows himself to the eleven. And when he does, he chews them out. How could you not believe? I, you know, I sent all these people. It says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the thing shall be established. We had at least three ladies. It looks like five ladies. They had seen Jesus. We had these two guys walk in totally separate events, three separate events. Seven people. You still didn't believe. How hard is your heart? I told you what was going to take place, and you didn't believe. I can only imagine Mary Magdalene nodding when Jesus was fussing at the disciples. I don't know that she was even there, but I can imagine it. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, And the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee, unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So this is the story we're about to read. And I pick up this passage in Matthew chapter 28, because it tells us that they're not still in Jerusalem. So Jesus had, had told them uh, earlier, he had made an appointment with them. See, it says where Jesus had appointed them. He said, but after that I am risen, I will go before you unto Galilee. This is right before he died. He said, I'm going to be dead three days. I'm coming back. And when I do, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. I'll be there before you get there. So I assume it's uh, the, the day that the guys go to Emmaus. The disciples are leaving and heading up to Galilee. The guys come back from Emmaus and meet them wherever they are. So it's probably late into the night. And... Uh, and the eleven disciples were, were had, had gone back there. In John chapter 20, verse 19, that same day at the evening, after the uh, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, so this is going to be back toward Galilee, for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So the eleven had, had moved somewhere north up toward Galilee, the two had walked out and come back and talked to the eleven before Jesus came to them, and they disbelieved them. And then they're all there, the doors are shut, and they're worried. Now, the reason I think they're worried is because when the ladies came and said, Jesus is gone, 
And the Pharisees immediately produce a story that says the disciples stole him at night. I'm sure that the disciples became wanted men at that point. They became the guys that stole Jesus out of the grave. So they're all afraid for their lives. So they go heading back up to Galilee, back toward the mountains. And they're in this remote section there. And uh, they've probably passed up through uh, Samaria, or they've maybe gone down by the river, down by the Jordan, and, and come up that way. And they're up there in this room, and they got the door shut. And Jesus comes in, and he stands in the middle of the room, and he says, Peace be unto you. Now, these guys are already all, all freaked out. They're already all terrified. Probably the two guys that had been on the road to Emmaus had just finished talking. And they're all talking back and forth, and suddenly there's another guy in the room. You know, this is not the first time Jesus did this. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, that's the guy you want in the room with you. He shows up, and suddenly he's in the room, and they're, whoa, and it's his peace. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You know, we have a term called doubting Thomas, and we use it for people. Are you a doubting Thomas? The whole other disciples doubted. Thomas just wasn't there for this particular time. And so he got burned at doubting Thomas. But when he showed up and he said, peace, they all freak out. And he goes, no, no, no. See, see, touch the nails right here. Touch the nails from my palm. Touch the hole in my side. And when they saw that, oh, they were so excited to see Jesus again. And then Jesus said to them again, because now they've settled down, peace be unto you. And as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them the Holy Ghost, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now this is an almost confusing verse. It sounds like Jesus has given the disciples the ability to take people's sins away. Yes. That's exactly what he did. And you too. Jesus says to him, Now you're filled with the Holy Ghost. We read in, in uh, later that, well, let's go to Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It says that Christ was there to reconcile the world, and that he hadn't imputed their trespasses but that he committed to us. That's what he just did to the disciples. He said, I'm giving you this word of reconciliation. It's yours now. I'm giving it to you. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Jesus said, as the Father sent me to bring the kingdom to the earth, even so now I am sending you. So Paul says, I go out and I am saying in Christ's stead because Christ has gone back to the Father. And he gave me the word of reconciliation, so I'm giving it to you. Be ye reconciled to God. Here's how that looks. If a man is super rich, super, super, richer than anybody has ever been rich, right? This bank account that's got so many zeros that you just can't count them all. And he comes and he hands you a checkbook. And he says, listen, I want to write you a check for a bazillion dollars. I want to write you a check. A gazillion dollars. I want to write you a check. And he goes, but not just that. I want to give you a checkbook. And I want, I want to deposit this in your account, this money. I want to deposit it. And I'm going to give you a checkbook, and I want you to go to everybody you meet and say, listen, my master, who's back there, gave me, we're going to call it a million dollars. He gave me a million dollars. And he deposited it into my bank account. And then he told me, I want to give you, everybody, a million dollars. Would you take my million dollars? That's, that's the message of reconciliation. That's what we, we're ambassadors. We've got checkbooks. And we're walking around and saying, be reconciled to God. He will forgive you and wash away your sins. And you can be with him forever in heaven. And, and, and he loves you and he died for you. Would you like to be reconciled? I'll sign it right now. I'll hand this letter of reconciliation to you, and then you'll have it, and you can give it to everybody else. You see, Jesus said, if you'll do it, whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. If you'll take that and you'll write that check, they've got it. And if you don't, if you don't, they won't. You know, there's people in India 
that have never heard a clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know why they haven't? Because we haven't been to India. Other Christians have. Great revivals taken place in India. Uh, it has now, but not everybody. You know, there's folks in in uh, New Guinea who have never understood the clear message of Jesus Christ. There's folks in the Philippines that have never understood a clear message of Jesus Christ, what He's done for them, and had the opportunity to clearly receive the letter of reconciliation that God has given you. You know, there's folks on the west side, right here on this island, folks in Lahui and Kapa'a, folks in Kalahua that have never received the message of reconciliation. It's never been given to them. It's up to us. And Jesus said, if we don't do it, if you don't do it, then they're not remitted. It's up to you. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. This is why he's done this. He said in Matthew 28, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus said, Now, because of my resurrection, because I've received the glory that I originally had, uh, now I have all power. All power in heaven and all power on earth. And I'm going to send you out. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Jesus said, I have now received this power, and I'm going to give it to you. Go and reconcile the nations. Teach them everything I've told you. Baptize them in my name. Let them become children of God, and if you don't do it, their sins aren't remitted. They won't get born again. They won't, they won't receive this message. They won't understand it. It's up to us to do it. It's up to us to decide to do it. It's up to us to give, to pray, to go. All of it. He's given us that message. What a responsibility, what a burden, and what a joy to be able to tell somebody, Jesus loves you. What a joy. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, I have begotten you to Jesus through the gospel. I was given that message of reconciliation. I've been a good ambassador, and I have remitted your sins by giving you this message. And they're remitted. They're gone. Now it's Jesus that's doing it. If I'm writing a check, it's not my money. If I'm the one with the checkbook and the ability to, to, to hand that off, it's not it's not my check. And this, it's not even my signature. I just have a bunch of signed checks to go give away. But it's my responsibility to give them away. Now it's their responsibility to receive it. If they don't receive it, then it won't do them any good. But until I offer it to them, until we offer it to them, they can't receive it, can they? How shall they hear except they preach? Except so there will be a preacher. Okay, John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the uh, print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas says, you will not convince me. I don't care what anybody says. I saw him die. And I will not be I will not be tricked again. I will not believe this again. It's not going to happen unless I put my fingers in the nail holes. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said of him, Thomas, Reach hither thy fingers, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faith faithless, but believing. Can you imagine the moment? Here they are again, and, and Thomas has stood for a week now. Absolutely not. Not going to believe this. And then Jesus suddenly appears in the room, and not only does he address Thomas, he addresses him verbatim. I know what you said. I was actually there listening. 
I am God, and I understand what you said. And he says, but I'm coming to you where you're at, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, put your hands in my side. Touch it, and be not faithless. Now, this is this is more than, not, than just start believing. Faithless is, you see, I'm part of the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm not of the Jewish faith or the Muslim faith. I'm part of the faith of Jesus Christ. I have joined his faith. And the way that I've joined his faith is by believing in him. And and then the, the faith that I have is met with a faith that God gives me, that puts that he, that he uh, blesses me with, and I grow in faith in him. And he says, you haven't got that kernel, that mustard seed yet, Thomas. I want you to not be faithless. I want you to not go around without being part of my faith, without believing in me. So in contrast to being faithless, believe me. Once you believe, you'll have joined my faith. You see, Christ didn't place the faith in Thomas before Thomas believed. Christ asked Thomas to believe and and then join Christ's faith. So he said, be not faithless, but believing. Now, if you'll recall this next verse, this next passage, this is where we started. The first Sunday that we talked about the book of John, we started uh, with with uh, the, the end of chapter 20. And it comes right after this piece, this verse with Thomas. And the reason is because the entire 20 chapters, whatever we'd say, 50, 60 lessons that we've done through the book of John, the entire 20 chapters has been leading to this passage right here. It's been leading to this, to this statement and this is the gospel, and it's the declaration that changes you from being faithless to being part of the faith of Jesus Christ. It's this statement in your soul that changes you from being on the path of hell to being on the path of Jesus, the path of Christ. He says that there is one way to enter in, and that's through Christ. And this is this this statement, I'm going to call it a soul statement, this statement, when you cry out with your soul, this statement, you become a child of God. John chapter 20, verse 28. I think Thomas falls to his knees, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. So Thomas stands before Christ. I think he falls to his knees, and he says, My Lord and my God. I want you to understand the magnitude of what Thomas has just said. The absolute, earth-shattering, world-changing, faith-building thing that Thomas has just said. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is ingrained into the culture, the language, the heart of every Israelite that follows the faith that, that was given through Moses, that follows the law. It says, Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. This mantra, the Lord our God is one Lord. But he's not three, but he's not many, but he's not all the others. He is one God, he's one Lord. This mantra is the foundation of of the Jewish faith. It's the foundation of the Christian faith. That God is one God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're one God. They're three. They're one God. And he says, you will love this one God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You will love this one God. And he says, I'm commanding you this day to do it with all your heart. And verse 7, Deuteronomy 6, 7, he says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. Teach these words to your kids. The Lord our God is one God. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When you're sitting in the house, son, who is God? The Lord our God is one Lord. Again and again. And when thou walkest in the way, when you're walking from place to place, you talk about this. Talk about the law of God and that he is one. And when thou walkest, to, or when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and upon thy gates. 
doesn't matter what you're doing, have this before you all the time. The Lord our God is one Lord. There is but one Lord and Master, and that is God, the great I Am, the Creator of heaven and earth. David says in Psalms 102, verse 24, I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old thou hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment as a vesture. Shalt thou change them, but they and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. David says, The Lord our God is one Lord, and you are from eternal to eternal. You never change. The world will fade. The garment will be destroyed. That is the planet. It will be recreated. Life will go on, but it won't happen here. And it will not change you because you are eternal. You are one God. Thomas fell before Jesus and said, You are one God. You are my God and my Lord and my commander and the only Lord God that there is. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the one that's made all things, and all things are by you and for you, and for your pleasure they are and were created. Thomas gets on his knees before Jesus and says, There is no other God beyond you. You're at Jesus. You are God, and there is none else. You know, the book of John says, Without this declaration, you're an antichrist. This is where so many people get so close. The Mormons are great people, great religious people. They do great religious works, and they are not children of God. When they die and they stand before the one Lord, the one God, He'll say, you denied my name. And they'll say, no, we didn't. And He says, the Lord our God is one God, and that's Jesus, and you denied my name. You said I was a brother of Satan, and so on and so forth. And without this recognition, without this sort of declaration that you are God, Jesus, then you are lost. Because there's one way to heaven. There's one way to the Father. And that's through the Son, Jesus Christ. And that's with this declaration. And John says that's what the whole book is about. He says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye, that's you. John, John says, I wrote this stuff down, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. The crescendo of the book of John, the point in which the whole focus of the book of John, the whole thing is about, is Thomas saying, My Lord and my God. And John says, I wrote this down so that you would say the same thing, so that you would recognize that He is your Lord and your God and that there is no other. Allah won't save you. Muhammad won't save you. Buddha won't save you. A mix of them won't save you. Jesus plus good works won't save you. When Thomas said, you are my Lord and my God, he was born again. He was, became a child of God and was redeemed, and he couldn't get more saved than that. And it wasn't because of anything he did. You can't drive buggies and get more saved. You can't wear your clothes without buttons or spray paint your hat black. That won't help you. You can't give alms or eat things or, or have uh, communion or none of that stuff's going to make you more born again. That's just this one thing, my Lord and my God, Jesus saved me then you're born again with that declaration. Now, I've heard it said, I can't believe something that I don't believe. And that's true. That's true. You can't believe something that you don't believe. You're like Thomas, where Thomas said, I will not believe, except I thrust my fingers into his side. I'll not believe. But Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12 says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken to you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. The Scripture says that when you get ready to search for Jesus with all your heart, when you get ready to search for God, when you seek Him and say, I want to know you, the God that created heaven and earth, the one that made all of this beauty that we see, the one that made the child, that I brought into the world, the one that made me, that made my wife, that, that created the, my ability to consider whether there even was a God or not. The God that may I want to know you. And that is the cry of your heart. When you're tender before Him, you'll find Him. You'll find Him. You'll find Him and you'll, and you'll experience the love of God that I've experienced. 
You'll experience that when you are ready to get on your knees before God and say to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And friends, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that he resurrected from the dead and that he's, that he's in his glory and that if we recognize him and if we come before him and call him Lord and Savior, if we call him God Almighty, the great I Am, and we put our faith and our trust in Him, then we are one with Him. We are a child of God. We are born again. And we are destined to be with Him for all of eternity. We are going to come back next week in John chapter 21. And we are going to look at the uh, uh, disciples and, and uh, what took place after this and the story with Peter. And... Um, it's, it's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. But this is the crescendo of the book of John. This is the moment of salvation, if you will. If you've gotten to here and you've not received Jesus as your Savior, you don't get a better time than this. You don't get a better moment than right now to call out and say, my Lord and my God, and to ask Him to save you. And He will. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for introducing us to the one Lord, to Jesus Christ, to the one God, to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that you are one. You are complete. Thank you for letting us be your children, for dying on the cross for us, for redeeming us, for giving us the message of reconciliation. Thank you for the careful proofs that you laid out so that this gospel message would permeate the world. Thank you for its change in my life and how you've redeemed and changed me. Lord, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters this morning, even if it's only in the Internet. Father, thank you for your, uh, your love towards us and all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray you go before us this week. Help us to be faithful stewards of the gospel. Help us to be uh, ministers and, Lord, to reach uh, those around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would be with our governor, be with our, our president, be with our mayor, be with our congressmen, senators. Lord, I pray that you would direct them to your perfect will, that it would be done for America and for the world. Father, I pray for the leaders of the entire world. I pray for the persecution that's taking place even this morning in China against the church, Father, and, and uh, against your children. And Father, I pray that you would use that persecution to purify and to grow them in you to cause them to be uh, light and salt um, and to make a difference and an impact. Father, thank you for the opportunities that you've given us this week. We love you and we, we love serving you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for joining us here at Crossroads Christian Fellowship. Wednesday night we will be back with uh, the book of Revelation. Until then, until Wednesday, enjoy the Lord, enjoy your family. And remember, one Lord, one God, Jesus Christ.